Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Dania Bafer. I'm the Executive Director at Gulf International Forum and also a professor or lecturer at Georgetown University. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, uh, to um, introduce this uh, workshop that we're having today um, entitled State Society Relations and the Institutional Channels of Economic Reform in the GCC State. Um, this panel uh, has been uh, heralded, uh, this panel has been assembled uh, to herald a new area of research on polit the politics of economic reform in the Gulf Cooperation Council countries um, to look at uh, literature beyond, you know, just the resource course, curse and the rentier state. Um, it is an opportunity uh, for us to learn about uh, new uh, research about the GCC states and also um, enabling a, a small and focused discussion about the papers to, to, to further um, research endeavors. And today we have uh, five papers to discuss. So I'm gonna name them, but not in order, like the titles of the paper. Um, the first uh, title is When Rentier Patronage Breaks Down, The Politics of Citizen Outsiders on Gulf Oil. And it's written by uh, Stephen Hertog who is a researcher at the London School of Economics. Um, the second paper we'll, we'll be reviewing today is Whether Rentierism, Trajectories of Adjustments in the Arab Gulf After the Era of Oil, um, of Oil Income Abundance by uh, Martin Beck with the University of South Denmark and Thomas Richer, Dr. Thomas Richer as well, with the German Institute for Global and Area uh, Studies. And we have a, a very interesting paper about energy transition um, by uh, Dr. Gaudat Bahgat with the National Defense University. And um, uh, the fourth paper will be Society and the State in the Post-Blockade Qatar, Lessons Learned um, for the Arab Gulf Region. Just, uh, this will be by Dr. Justin Gingler. He's a research associate professor for the Social and Economic Survey Research Institute at Qatar University. And the fifth paper, uh, Variation in State Autonomy in GCC Economies, Business Elite Dominance and the Asymmetry of Interest Affecting Reform is actually by yours truly. Um, I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, I look forward to having a very uh, um, engaging and intellectually stimulating uh, discussion. Um, we'll first start out um, with uh, Dr. Bahgat's uh, paper on energy transition, and it will be reviewed by Dr. Beck and Dr. Richard. Dr. Bahgat? Thank you, Dr. Safar. Thank you, Dania. And it's a great to, to be with you and all my colleagues. <clears throat> I will uh, say a few words on my paper about energy transition. And it is interesting to talk about energy transition now because, as everybody knows, the Climate Change Conference in Scotland is uh, going on as we speak today. And uh, this makes the topic even more interesting. Uh, energy transition is not a new topic. Uh, many countries have been talking about it for a long time, but probably what is uh, new about it, it is more urgent than ever. It is the topic now. And uh, Probably there is difference between this energy transition and other uh, experiences of energy transition. By this I mean at one point uh, human civilization, the whole world changed from uh, coal to oil, uh, from human power to machine. Uh, the reason for the previous energy transitions uh, was uh, 
that the new source of energy was more efficient than the previous one. Uh, the current energy transition is driven uh, by uh, policy. It is not that new source of energy uh, is better, more efficient than the previous one. It is because uh, we human beings, we discovered that the source of energy we have been using, mainly oil, gas, and coal, are very polluting and that this pollution uh, has uh, severe economic, political, strategic health uh, impact on human life. And this is why uh, we, the whole world is moving in the direction of uh, changing the energy mix. Uh, United Nations has been leading these efforts, and again, as we speak now, the conference in Scotland is number 26, and it looks a very important conference. Uh, the outcome we will know in a few days, uh, but it looks probably we will have more promises than uh, actual work. This conference also comes uh, with the background of two very influential uh, reports, one uh, by uh, the International Energy Agency, IEA, and the other one by OPEC. The IEA uh, is talking about uh, how uh, oil consumption should go down very quickly, and uh, it has, the report has different scenarios and uh, IEA, International Energy Agency, is taking the lead in advocating moving away from oil. And the, the alternative is renewable energy and to less extent nuclear power. Uh, on the other hand, the OPEC report uh, predicts that uh, oil will remain important source of energy and uh, also uh, the report by OPEC makes very interesting, very important point. It is not only the share of oil will remain significant in the global energy mix, but also the consumption of oil will vary from one region to another, meaning that uh, United States, Europe, uh, basically developed country, Western countries will consume less uh, oil and gas, and China, Asian countries, China, India, Japan, South Korea, will consume more oil and gas. Uh, the two organizations, IEA and OPEC, uh, they predict what will happen in the next 10, 15 years. So there is no way to know which is right. They come with uh, almost opposite scenarios, opposite uh, predictions. But what we do know, and this is the focus of the paper, is about uh, oil producing countries, especially in the Gulf. The main argument I try to make in the paper is uh, it, it will be very hard to make this energy transition without engaging oil producing countries without understanding their needs and uh, I believe many of the papers we have today agree that uh, there is uh, so much needed by oil producing countries to uh, make this energy transition. By this I mean many of them have been talking about uh, economic reform reducing their dependency on oil, diversifying their energy mix and the, diversifying their economies. But so far, in reality, very little has been done and there is a long way to go. But uh, with, with these conflicting signals, conflicting scenarios, uh, oil producing countries have been reacting in different ways. Uh, one common uh, way of reacting to these changing uh, dynamics of uh, 
global energy market is uh, what is known in the literature as stranded assets. Basically, when countries uh, feel, when governments feel that uh, peak oil demand is about to take place, they try to uh, sell as much oil, as much of their assets before they lose their value. Uh, so far, OPEC policy has been more or less to manage the market, meaning uh, to uh, try to match production with demand. Uh, when uh, government leaders uh, believe that there will not be demand for oil in the coming few years, they will try to avoid this phenomenon known as stra stranded assets and try to sell as much at any price. Uh, again, it is interesting to talk about this because as we speak today, one barrel of oil is about 80, 82 uh, dollars, uh, which is the highest in about six, seven years. So uh, it looks we are not uh, close to peak oil demand. Uh, like, like any commodity, the price reflects the balance between supply and demand. And as, as we speak today, in the last three, four months, it looks uh, the demand is uh, much higher than the supply. And this is why prices are high. Uh, probably my, my main point with this uncertainties, and probably I, I don't want to take more than 10 minutes in my presentation. Uh, my uh, looking for, forward, my takeaway is oil producing countries have to uh, mitigate the uh, follow mitigation because uh, it looks to me oil will remain with us for some time. Uh, like electric cars are making huge advances, but uh, we still need cars which run on uh, petroleum, run on gas. Uh, the transition will take some time and uh, it is very important to be aware of the speed and the path of this transition. Uh, renewable energy is, is great, is clean. Uh, we can use it, but we do not have enough uh, renewable energy now or nuclear power now to replace oil and gas. Uh, so we do not need to rush. And probably my recommendation is uh, for oil producing countries is to invest in how to capture the emissions, the pollution from oil and gas, because oil and gas will be with us for some time till uh, renewable energy is developed enough to replace oil and gas. The title, I think, that Daniel referred to at the beginning has been changed a bit for this particular presentation from the paper, um, focusing on the temporal aspect of the data. So I've been collecting survey data from the Gulf, from Qatar for the past decade. And this is actually the first time that I've stepped back to sort of look at what kind of trends are discernible across the region, sorry, across um, these 10 years on different social and economic dimensions. Yeah, so if you wanna go um, to the second slide, I think this is it. Um, the real question then is to what extent and why are state society relations changing in the Gulf? And uh, using Qatar as a, a particular example where we have good empirical data, which is more or less lacking from, from the rest of the region. We have lots of different potential drivers of change over the past 10 years, starting in the Arab Spring, the oil crash, uh, wars and militarization, the blockade of Qatar, COVID, and lots of changes, right? So welfare retrenchment and taxation, 
social liberalization, especially in Saudi Arabia, and maybe some moves towards rethinking immigration schemes and, and thinking about nationality in the UAE. But the question is, are these changes um, and policy responses redirections from the previous trajectory, or are they simply accelerations of existing trends, right? So are these things that uh, represent a continuum or sorry, a point along a continuum that we can sort of observe over some period of time, or really they are um, step changes precipitated by exogenous drivers of change. Okay, you can go ahead to the next slide, thank you. And so for example, we know based on uh, studies prior to and after the Qatar blockade, that there were some shifts in political orientations among citizens that you can attribute to that event, given the fact that uh, the surveys were conducted very close together with only the blockade intervening in the middle. Um, we can take a look more closely at some of these results uh, if people are interested at the end. Please, next slide. Um, including about attitudes towards democracy uh, seem to have shifted from before the blockade to after the blockade. The post blockade are here in red, pre-blockade in uh, gray. Seems like there's a stronger preference in the Qatar case, at least for a democratic system of government after the blockade versus data that were collected right before. Can we go to the next slide, please? But the question is, um, are these shifts caused by that particular event uh, or are they part of a wider change that we could observe over the decade, right? And so if they're merely short-term changes as a result of this shock, in this case, using the Qatar blockade as a kind of case study, um, then these are ultimately temporary effects on state society relations that are likely to dissipate over time. Uh, they wouldn't be then, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, they wouldn't be evidence of a longer term change. And they also wouldn't really be generalizable across the region because they would be a result of this particular shock that happened to one of the GCC states, Qatar, and, and not other states. On the other hand, if the kinds of changes that we witness uh, from before and after the blockade and over the, or are in fact, um, part of a wider trend that's observable throughout the entire decade, then it's not simply a function of the embargo, but something else, um, suggesting more systematic temporal changes in relations. And at that point, if we can conclude that changes witnessed over this period are uh, not only the result of this shock of the blockade in Qatar, but wider trend, then we might be able to distill some lessons for other GCC states to the extent that these seem to be structural processes of change. Next slide, please. Right, so the research design then for this paper is sort of to try to arbitrate between this idea of short-term changes as a function of the blockade specifically versus a longer-term shift. And it looks at three domains in particular in the wider context of state society relations. One is social relations between different demographic and ethnic groups in society and intergroup trust between individuals in these groups. Secondly, political participation, so sort of social, political, and then finally, uh, welfare and economic dependence. And the data that will be used for this paper are national level survey data from Qatar that are representative of both citizen and expatriate populations where re relevant. And it covers this period as I mentioned, with some gaps between 2010 and 2019. So it's very rare uh, if anybody here has attempted to locate survey data from most places in the Gulf to find not only cross-sectional data, but data that has a common set of indicators collected over time. And these are data that, again, are um, from my institute here at Qatar University. Next slide, please. So the first thing we can witness over this period from, in this case, 2011 to 2019, um, is a change in trust in different social groups, but 
only a change in trust in some social groups. Um, and this is speaking in particular of nationals in Qatar. So Qataris, self-reported trust in different um, nationality groups in society. And we see that in particular, trust in Westerners as a group has increased substantially over this decade. Whereas on the other hand, for example, trust in South Asian, so uh, migrant labor populations has not substantially increased. Likewise, trust in fellow Arabs, Arab expatriates in the Gulf has increased uh, significantly, statistically significantly over this period. But trust in fellow citizens from 2011 to 2019 on average has not changed. Uh, and then if we go to the next slide, uh, and then you can actually go to the next slide again, we'll look at the matrix of intergroup trust between uh, not only Qatari citizens, but all the group's tr levels of trust in each other. And so there's sort of a lot going on here, but what you find is that there is a gap in social trust in the sense that uh, all groups report very high levels of trust in Qatari nationals, but that trust is not reciprocated by citizens uh, towards the expatriate groups, in particular, um, South Asian expats and Western expats to a less extent uh, with Arab expats. And so we still see these gaps in levels of trust between different groups of uh, different groups in society. These data were actually collected in 2018. So not looking temporally, but looking at one point in time, but again, illustrating this gap in social trust to the point that um, barely a majority of Qataris in 2018, 54%, report trusting highly or somewhat um, South Asian expatriates. And just two thirds reporting high or somewhat trusting uh, Westerners relative to 91% of Arab expats and 95% of fellow citizens. So there's substantial differences here. Next slide, please. On the question of interest in politics and democracy over this period, um, you'll notice that from 2016 and in particular 2017, the blockade year, June 2017, to 18, we see a big jump in interest in politics and democracy. And there were some slides earlier that I showed in the presentation that suggested this change, this, this um, increase in interest in democratic governance or living in a democratic country among citizens in Qatar. And the question is, uh, is that attributable to the blockade specifically? Um, and, and or is it part of a larger trend uh, that we can sort of discern across the uh, wider decade? And what we'll find across the wider decade is that there's a general upward trend in uh, interest in politics, and also importance of attached to democratic governance. But this trend is uh, impacted very severely by uh, exogenous events, in particular the Arab Spring, dampened interest in political uh, interest in politics and the importance attached to democratic government substantially. So from 2010, dropping in 2011, uh, and only thereafter increasing. In 2015, we see a very precipitous decline uh, in interest in democracy and interest in politics. I would attribute that to, and sort of people here anecdotally have attributed it to, as discussed in the paper, uh, the rise of the Yemen war, the, uh, the, the acceleration or the deepening of the Syrian crisis at this time, and also the rise of MBS. And so essentially, uh, insecurity at the regional level and the impact that that has on people's uh, appetite for democratic governance. And after the blockade period between 2018 and 19, we saw that that initial bump from 17 to 18 has come down on interest in politics, but not interest in living in a democratic country. And so this sort of gap, which we saw also prior to the Arab Spring, is reappearing where there's more people who are interested in democracy than they're interested in political participation in the country. And it'll be interesting to see with additional data points how um, this gap continues or, or, or maybe normalizes. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, 
And finally, on the question of, of household income, unfortunately, uh, we don't have very consistent income data over time because of changes in the way that it's measured. Um, but what we can show is that between the blockade year, 2017, the pre-blockade, and 2018, after the blockade, we saw a substantial increase in total household income among Qatari nationals. And looking back over uh, the data from the past 10 years, although it's not shown here, and although it's measured in sort of different ways, what we find is that there was no other substantial increase in household income, except for after the Arab Spring, when the government raised uh, public sector salaries by 60%, 60%, and 120% for people working in the police and military. And so after that increase in 2011, the in total household income among citizens was essentially flat until the blockade, where we saw again this significant jump attributable to more women working potentially, to more entrepreneurship, et cetera. And after the blockade year, sorry, after the, the post-blockade year 2018, we've also not seen significant increases. And so the conclusion is that in these two large sort of uh, shocks, political shocks, the Arab Spring and the blockade, we saw two substantial bumps in citizen income, household income, which points to the continued relevance of economic patronage and distribution by the state to citizens as a sort of pressure relieving mechanism, right? So rather than uh, decreasing economic dependence over time, we seem to be seeing increased economic dependence and both from the standpoint of the state and from the standpoint of citizens, the increased importance of this uh, relationship, sort of the, the rentier, let's say bargain, as far as economics goes. Uh, next slide, please. And so if we want to summarize sort of these trends, we find that on social relations and, tr and trust, we see increased citizen trust in Arabs and Westerners, uh, relatively uh, flat levels of trust in fellow citizens, which is already higher than among expats anyway. But still, the high expatriate trust in nationals is not reciprocated, right? On the interest in politics and democracy domain, there's a gradual upward trend in interest since 2010, but it's tempered by regional conflicts, right? And there's also this question of whether or not democratic interest seems to be outpacing political interest at different points, most importantly prior to the Arab Spring and now after the blockade, and how that might uh, manifest itself in politics. And finally, in the area of welfare and economic dependence, we see a substantial increase rather than decrease in Qatari wealth after the blockade but no other increases before or after, apart from the salary hike, pointing to economic patronage as a, a, a key political tool and an increasing rather than decreasing uh, reliance of citizens upon the state and the state's reliance upon patronage as a sort of political tool. I think we have one more slide. And so the question is, at a broader level, what kinds of lessons might we distill for the other GCC states, since we've established that most of these uh, trends are not limited to the blockade per se, but seem to reflect uh, longer term processes of change. On the question of social relations, we see gradual but slow citizen acceptance of expatriates and also wide variation in acceptance according to cultural or nationality group. And so, uh, you know, as maybe uh, conventional wisdom might already suggest, social trust may not translate into political acceptance of uh, these expatriate groups, which may have implications for efforts in the United Arab Emirates and, and elsewhere. UAE is probably on the forefront of this kind of push to integrate more closely expatriates into uh, social and, and especially political life in, in the Gulf. On the question of political participation, we see the real impact of worry over instability and the fact that uh, fears over the loss of security, especially in the face of all of the instability going on at the regional level, at the global level now with the COVID pandemic, really seem to outweigh people's preferences that they might have for political reform. And finally, um, you know, maybe it doesn't come as any surprise, but in, in Qatar at least, and I think uh, safe to say 
elsewhere in the region as well, economic levers remain the state's political fallback. Uh, many GCC citizens um, in the wealthier states, UAE, Kuwait, uh, Qatar certainly, are still insulated from economic pain as a result of COVID, as a result of the blockade in the case of Qatar. And they're not really feeling much pinch from um, economic, fiscal restructuring, right? In some countries in the GCC, like Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, that might be true, but certainly there are, there's this divide between, as we talked about before, kind of the, the haves and haves nots in the Gulf. And, and this is likely to um, manifest itself in, in many ways, not just as we heard in uh, Dr. Baggett's paper, in uh, ability to transition, ability and appetite to transition away from oil, but also the, uh, the feasibility of continuing to use economic patronage as a political regime survival strategy. So thank you very much uh, for bearing with us through the difficulties with the presentation. Hopefully the data were uh, interesting and, and some of these conclusions based on a decade of results from Qatar. Yeah, thanks to the to the organizers um, of the GIF uh, for inviting us to present our paper, Wither Rentierism, Trajectories of Adjustment in the Arab Gulf After the Era of Oil Income Abundance. This paper, um, I should mention, is a follow-up of a Manchester University Press book on oil and the political economy in the Middle East that Thomas and me co-edited. The book delivers as we believe, the first comprehensive analysis of the Middle Eastern political economy in response to the 2014 oil price decline. In the paper, we elaborated on ideas that we developed in our co-authored framework chapter and co-authored concluding chapter, Thomas and me. The book covers not only the Arab Gulf, but also the Mashrik, whereas the paper uh, focuses strictly on the GCC members. As we point out um, in our paper, uh, Thomas and I believe that the post-2014 oil price decline is not just cyclical, but marks structural change. As a result of the oil price decline, the long era of oil income abundance in the Arab Gulf has come to an end. This trend from oil income abundance to oil income scarcity puts pressure on the Arab Gulf regimes to launch adjustment policies. So what did we do? We examined some of these adjustment policies on the international and some on the domestic level. On the international and regional level, we analyzed several adjustment policies, for example, GCC initiatives in terms of introducing taxes. However, I want to focus in this short presentation on the most important because most effective international adjustment policy. And this is the cooperation in oil policies in the frame of OPEC Plus, which was formed in 2016. OPEC Plus, and that's fascinating, proved to be robust, even in the wake of the pandemic induced price crash. It was a real crash in 2020. And all this, although a graduated prisoner's dilemma, puts high structural obstacles to successful cooperation. I just want to mention some of these obstacles. The first one is um, orientation towards relative gains, which is high between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. And this is normally a killer for cooperation because, because it, if, if you're oriented toward relative gains, uh, benefits of the foe of the, other, of the other one are counted as costs. Then there's a notorious problem of distributing quotas according to what criteria should they, should they be attributed, um, according to needs, how, however defined, or according to historic um, production um, and so on. Then this is typical for, um, for, uh, for the prison's dilemma situation. There are incentives to defect even after cooperation is established. So each and every member of, of OPEC plus 
has at each and every moment um, of oil production an, an incentive to cheat, meaning to, to produce more, to exceed the quota, because this simply increases um, income. But of course, if as all members have the same incentive, this is, is a, a recipe for, 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 the, for the breakdown of the, the whole cooperation, which has not happened so far. And last but not least, you have a problem of free riders, especially private American co companies that certain times also were strongly supported by the US state. Not so much in these days, um, but, but um, until last year, this was the case. So I will now pass to, to, to Thomas. Thank you, Martin. Um, let me say, in addition to some of the international level adjustments post uh, 2014, uh, a few words are about, about uh, major domestic trends. So we especially discuss uh, two of them in the paper. Uh, the first is uh, that uh, foreign migrant workers um, uh, have been the main social losers of adjustment policies across the GCC. And secondly, uh, there are, um, interestingly, some institutions which have played, uh, a, 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 from a comparative perspective, a crucial role for, for current adjustment trajectories. So as for the first point, Migrant workers and not citizens, uh, that's important, uh, we believe, have been the main social losers since 2014. Migrant workers have been disproportionately affected by adjustment policies, as we argue in the paper. And many, for instance, many of them have, um, have left uh, uh, the GCC because of the payment problems immediately arising in the autumn of 2014, mm -hmm. especially in the private sector. But there were also many specific policies directly targeting migrant workers like increasing fees or decreasing subsidies. And in addition to that, the implementation of VAT was much more costly for migrant workers at the household level due to the lower average um, income. Uh, for the second point, um, institutions have played an important role by shaping country specific adjustments policies since 2014. And uh, Martin mentioned the volume. We have a number of different case studies here across the GCC. They all highlight um, uh, the differences. Um, I just concentrate on one very prominent difference at the macro level. So Kuwait is on the one hand, uh, which stands out uh, by having the most powerful institutional veto player, veto player, I'm sorry, um, uh, its parliament, which was able to block all attempts to reduce government spending post-2014. Uh, On the other hand is uh, Qatar, as, um, uh, uh, but also within the United Arab Emirates, especially uh, some of uh, the, the, the largest uh, Emirate I would be, you have clearly um, uh, clear-cut centralized and authoritarian ways of formulating and implementing adjustment policies. So you, you see some 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 uh, interesting differences here. So, um, what, what in conclusion, uh, what can we learn from looking at the period post uh, 2014? So we try to elaborate um, on this in the final part of the paper and highlight a number of different points. But I think it's interesting um, to to uh, look uh, at two conceptual uh, ideas we. We try to to spread, uh, try that to kind of um, uh, um, uh, make in the paper. So first, um, considering increasing exploitation, especially of migrant workers, and continuing control on the other side of capital accumulate, accumulating organizations by the ruling families, we suggest focusing more strongly on debates about state class relations in the context of rentierism. So despite a significant decline of government fiscal revenues, the state class, as we call it, still controls the accumulation of monetary assets. So this includes the production of hydrocarbons, but goes well beyond that, as the increasing role of public investment fund shows. Therefore, diversification, diversification efforts, national investments in petrochemicals or tourism or renewable energy as well as all of the major international acquisitions have remained and will remain 
in the hands of a small group of uh, decision makers, mainly consisting of members of the respective royal families. And this perspective in the context of state class relations should be more carefully integrated into the existing framework of rentarism. So this is um, our first conceptual point um, in the final discussions um, of the paper. The second point is that we believe that institutions have played an important role, um, a, a role which has been very much overlooked since um, uh, 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 in the existing literature. So Martin has highlight, uh, highlighted the supportive role of OPEC institutional structures for the creation of OPEC plus, but there is also a lot of evidence pointing to the role of domestic institutions. It's been crucial to understand differences across the GCC. This is especially interesting since the standard notion of rentarism tends to assume that oil income makes political and social institutions alike by providing uniform incentives that will eventually result in similar policies. And the recent period shows that, that this is a misunderstanding um, and, and thereby uh, uh, confirms a conceptual argument made by um, uh, Chaudhry and uh, Pete Moore uh, uh, almost two decades ago, that among, other, among others, um, that when analyzing previous crisis periods and uh, when they have been focusing on previous crisis um, periods in rent uh, states and, and the rental systems. So the point is that institutional particularities are a result of different pathways taking at critical junctures in history, which can lead to differences in crisis adjustment policies today. And with that, uh, I thank you very much for listening. Um, so uh, the, the basic story of the paper, which I think also relates to some of the uh, other concerns about the changing social contract and fiscal constraints that were raised by, by some of the other pieces in the workshop. Uh, the, the basic concern is to look at what happens to people in the Gulf countries, particularly the lower rent countries, Bahrain, Oman and Saudi Arabia, who are too young to get uh, their share of the original uh, pie that's uh, sort of the the bedrock of the social contract, namely a job in the public sector. And uh, the, the paper shows in figures that in those three countries, new cohorts of labor market entrants by and large do not get government jobs. There's only a, a minority that get government jobs, whereas historically, at least for male citizens, there was pretty much a guarantee that sooner or later they'd get a, a plum job in the bureaucracy. Um, so there's a really deep disconnect between the existing stock of nationals uh, active in the labor market, most of whom do hold a government job, and the new entrants, so the flows into the labor market that are mostly excluded from that kind of deal. And I, I think the importance of government employment for the social contract and for the welfare of citizen households really can't be overstated. You know, it's, it's orders of magnitude more important than pretty much any other volunteer benefit you get as a GCC citizen. So it's a really fundamental uh, reshaping of the social contract for at least those three, uh, I mean, relatively lower rent countries. It's probably going to happen at some point in Qatar, the UAE and Kuwait, but we haven't reached that point yet. The fiscal constraints aren't that acute. Um, so uh, those excluded citizens, of course, most of them don't live in poverty. Uh, they get all sorts of uh, benefits from government that are supposed to uh, make them competitive or at least get them into some sort of job in the private sector, be it wage subsidies or national quotas that privilege them over migrants. Uh, so they're not on the on the same level, materially speaking, as migrant workers. They, they got many, many material privileges uh, above what migrant workers enjoy. And yet what they have is much, much worse on average than the historical insider deal of a government job. And they have to compete with migrants are sourced from the global south through essentially a flat, very low-lying labor supply curve uh, that makes it very, very hard for them to compete on uh, on wages. And as a result, the prevailing wages for citizens in the private sector, even if you control for uh, education and experience and all sorts of other factors, are very, very substantially lower than what citizens get in the public sector. So the cleavage between insiders and outsiders there is pretty deep. 
even if uh, the ultimate outsiders, migrants, of course, are in yet another category with very, very low wages and quite limited labor rights. Um, so I, I show the emergence of this phenomenon with uh, some detailed data on the, the size or the, the stagnating size of civil services in those three mid-rent countries, uh, despite growing uh, overall citizen population. I show the, the very stark difference in the wages across different segments. Uh, I show that the age distribution of wages and the age distribution of employment by sector reflects uh, this kind of new segmentation very starkly uh, and um, make the argument that this is really the key material cleavage among citizens now and it's uh, almost perfectly structured by age you know it's it's a, a lottery as to when you were born whether you still got access to these benefits or not and and this cleavage is in many ways more dominant than uh, any other material cleavage in, in those populations um so uh why is this important uh, i think uh, it is important for at least Two reasons. One is that if you look at the kind of sporadic incidents of unrest or, or the very uh, the, the very profound incidents of unrest in Bahrain, uh, in the case of Bahrain in 2010-2011, uh, the, the, the drivers of those actions often were labor market outsiders. So there were underemployed nationals with terrible jobs in the private sector, or there were uh, unemployed nationals who were also outsiders because they don't have access to government jobs anymore. And the claims that were made in most protests, although of course the Bahraini protest morphed into something bigger and more political, but the claim for most protests, even at the, the origin in Bahrain, were really uh, the claims of outsiders. They wanted government jobs, or they wanted the government to make sure that the private sector provides good jobs for them. Uh, they wanted essentially to be made insiders. And that's uh, certainly sort of the, the general tenor of all the demonstrations, the protests that you've had in Oman. That's why they, they always protest in front of the Ministry of Labor, which is a very weird place to protest for uh, in terms of uh, socioeconomic unrest in, in uh, global comparison. Um, so certainly in Bahrain and Oman, and in the few incidents where there were protests or at least grumbling on social media uh, about socioeconomic issues in Saudi Arabia, it was really outsiders who were uh, upset about the situation. Um, and I, I would argue that you know if there's going to be unrest in the region, it's going to be uh, probably organized in some way around this kind of cleavage. Although I'm not sure there is going to be unrest, but it, it is sort of the one fault line where I think there's there's a real potential danger for regimes. Uh, but even when uh, you don't look at uh, regime stability and acute uh, socioeconomic unrest or discontent, uh, the, the way that economic policy gets negotiated, particularly migration and labor policy, has also changed uh, through the emergence of these outsider groups. So uh, I've, got, uh, I've got a case study of labor politics in Bahrain, uh, where I show that it's organizations that represent those outsiders, so private sector unions that are uh, historically closely linked to the uh, Shiite opposition groups, uh, they actually have a very different uh, profile of socioeconomic interests from uh, insiders who are or, who are uh, employed in the public sector. Uh, and interestingly, those um, opposition-linked unions actually supported the regime in its pro-migrant uh, labor market reforms and in, in, uh, the abolition or at least the, the dilution of the sponsorship system in the early 2000s, in the late two, uh, 2000s. Uh, and uh, it, it did that, I argue, out of a material interest to actually improve the rights of migrants once they enter the country, because if migrants get terribly exploited in the private uh, labor market, then uh, effectively employers are always going to prefer those exploitable migrants over citizens. So they have a structural, citizens uh, who are outsiders, who are active on the private labor market, have a structural interest in improving uh, the labor rights of migrants. And we've seen that systematically in Bahrain, we've seen it to a lesser extent in some of the other countries. At the same time, insiders have a structural interest in actually continued migrant exploitation because it decreases uh, the price of goods and services, it, uh, it improves the convenience of their daily life. So there's a new kind of cleavage between insiders and outsiders also with regard to how to manage the labor market more broadly uh, and the large migrant population. Um, so uh, this kind of limited, clearly visible potential for labor solidarity between outsiders and migrants is a real departure from the old Rontier social contract that was really based on uh, giving as few rights as possible to the migrants and letting them serve uh, the the insider population on uh, the, the private market for for consumer service and domestic services um, 
So uh, I think this whole story has a couple of theoretical ramifications. Uh, first, uh, there's a new key horizontal cleavage among frontier citizens. There's quite a bit of literature already saying that, well, rent distribution is not politically neutral. You know, money doesn't distribute itself. Inequality in rent distribution can create uh, discontent. Uh, but this was this argument was usually made around kind of smaller scale patronage or ascription based uh, sort of tribal or sectarian distribution. I think now we've got a new phenomenon where uh, we've got a clear class basis uh, related very closely to the age structure of citizen populations that create a new kind of more modern cleavage between insiders and outsiders. So a non-ascriptive large scale form of exclusion, which I think is politically quite relevant. Um, and then I also argue that uh, this kind of unintent unintended breakdown of patronage has unintentionally created new excluded social groups. Uh, so uh, Michael Ross has described the, the group formation effect as one of the bedrock mechanisms of the rentier state where targeted patronage can kind of reshape and co-opt groups, but sort of the absence of patronage can also create groups and these groups can be potentially politically problematic for the regime. Um, and uh, now finally, I make some observations about how this whole insider outsider story is actually quite similar to the comparative political economy of dual labor markets in other world regions, including uh, continental, particularly southern Europe. Uh, but you know, we, we don't have to go into that. But all the theoretical ambition here is to bring this very rich conceptual um, toolkit of comparative political economy of dual labor markets from Europe to other regions, uh, and in this case, the GCC, but I'm also hoping to do more work on uh, dual labor markets in the wider Middle East and, and potentially the, the, the global South more broadly. So it's, it's sort of a, a new research agenda. There's a lot more empirical work to do about the actual interests of insiders and outsiders, including uh, ideally survey work, you know, more case studies about labor politics. Uh, so it's as much sort of an agenda setting piece as a finished piece of research. So I will uh, be talking about a point that actually Gildad brought up uh, about how private is the private sector. Um, uh, uh, it, it really links into um, uh, my paper, which talks about um, uh, the variation in state autonomy to implement economic uh, reform. Um, and the title is Variation in State Autonomy in the GCC Economies, Business Elite Dominance and Asymmetry of Interest for Reform. And um, the, the variation in state autonomy in Gulf economies is consequential for many aspects of uh, their economic uh, development trajectories, including um, the distribution of power uh, between the business elites and the state in the private sector. Um, and this is kind of one way in which I try to gauge or conceptualize the level of state autonomy in the GCC states. Uh, generally speaking, there's always this uh, assumption, um, the prevailing scholarship on the political economy of the GCC states often rooted um, in the rentier literature inflates the role of the state, uh, assuming that it has an indomitable degree of an autonomy Yet, um, I, do, I do think it's important to, to make the point that Gulf states display variation um, in their level of state autonomy, especially regards to elite politics and the implementation of economic reform. Um, notably, uh, really state autonomy lacked a salient definition in, in the Gulf literature. Um, however, when you, you go into other literatures like the development state literature, it defines state autonomy as embedded in a concrete set of social ties that bind the state to society and provide um, a concrete set of institutional channels for the continual negotiation and renegotiation of goals and policy. Um, I chose to engage this liter because, literature because it emphasizes the importance of a coherent and co cohesive state apparatus that is really closely tied uh, to the economic elite. And I think the underlying assumption of my argument, which is nested in this literature, is that uh, the state and the business elite need to share a common interest to conduct a successful reform. So I argue uh, 
contrary to the narrative advanced in, in classical Gulf literature, especially in rentierism, GCC states vary in their ca capacity to implement economic reform. Um, and I measure that uh, as a function of state autonomy with regards to the degree of business elite influence uh, held over the private sector or domestic economy. Um, this variance in the institutional ecosystems of the Gulf economies can constrain state economy and affect the feasibility of achieving economic diversification. And um, the variation of state autonomy versus the amount of business elite dominance is an important indicator for the level of state-led capitalism in the GCC uh, economies. So basically, to try to, to prove my argument, um, I conduct uh, comparative case studies uh, using the diverse uh, case method, selecting three states, which are Qatar, Kuwait, and Bahrain, and try to kind of achieve the most degree of variance in relative, uh, relevant uh, dimensions that affect uh, 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 important variables that I'm trying to measure. Um, so going into my case studies and empirical evidence, um, I, I look at state autonomy in the various levels of elite dominance um, in the three aforementioned uh, states. So I, in, in this, I look at the number of families in uh, elite business elite families in certain industries, um, the number of board seats held by these families and the amount of wealth uh, concentrated in the hands of a few um it is in it is really i think everyone knows that it's undeniable that there is an oligarchic kind of business elite dominance across the gulf um excuse me sorry i, I have a little bit cold I have, a, I have a i have a virus so I'm a little bit uh stuffed up um each state has a commonality of elite uh dominance in the private sector yet varies in, 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 in its level of influence, which I argue is intrinsically linked to the state's embedded autonomy uh, to implement reforms. So I, uh, I have one variable I evaluated is the amount of market capitalization of the state, um, which suggests, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a way to gauge different levels of state autonomy across the private sector. So the level of business elite dominance or state-led capitalism can further be exemplified by the level of state ownership in top companies. So th this is what um, market capitalization is. And among the top ten, uh, 10 companies by market capitalization, um, there are varying levels of state ownership and listed companies for Qatar, Kuwait, and Bahrain. Um, Qatar's market capitalization was valued at 109.61 billion, Kuwait at 41 billion, and Bahrain at 15 billion. And as the study demonstrated, Qatar asserts the strongest state ownership among the three cases. Bahrain exhibits uh, the second strongest state ownership, but has uh, several companies that are fully private. And Kuwait, um, which probably if you follow Kuwait closely, you wouldn't be surprised um, that only two companies uh, uh, that the, has only two companies that were fully private and the state ownership is uh, is often substantially less than half, lower than 30% of most cases across the remaining eight companies. So Kuwait had the least amount of government ownership in these companies. So in this regard, by this measurement, Qatar's government has a, 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 a deeper reach um, in these big companies, uh, which gives it more uh, autonomy in reform. Uh, um, and this trend is perpetrated through other indicators as well for state autonomy. I looked at the distribution of board seats. Um, and when you look at it, you see that how many, you know, I would say from the ruling family are on these board seats um, versus the business elite. And the same trend uh, kind of uh, uh, was shown that um, that in Kuwait, the business elites had much more board seats and influence than in Qatar and Bahrain uh, was somewhat in the middle. 
Um, and then I kind of looked at the number of oligarchic players, um, if you will, out of the three countries is, uh, assessed, Kuwait leads with the largest number of private sector oligarchic players, um, followed by Bahrain and Qatar with the fewest. So, um, uh, so, in, and this is uh, what you see here is again in, in this measurement that um, uh, there's a lot less uh, business elite players um, in the market in, in, in Qatar uh, than there is in uh, 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 Bahrain and especially Kuwait. Um, and so, how the uh, private sector uh, distribution really affects uh, interest for reform is important. Um, the current institutional environment that creates incentives for the business elite to participate in certain industry really annul, annul them um, for being drivers of economic diversification um, or innovation. And given that the majority of business elite industries are not drivers of economic uh, diversification or innovation, um, they have high barriers for entry. They largely employ migrant workers. This level of influence has substantial uh, implications for the impl implementation of economic reforms. So consequently, um, there is an, an asymmetry of economic interest between the youth majority, which we have discussed earlier in our engagement, seeking future employment and the business elite minority uh, kind of content with the status quo. Um, data collected for this study revealed that there's a small number of highly diversified major players in Gulf economies. The top three industries uh, dominated uh, by the business elite families um, is construction, real estate and banking. And construction consisted 45% of all major business elites families across three countries. So the, um, and then the real estate industry becomes second and the banking industry third. And of these uh, three cases, Kuwait has the greatest number of business elite uh, families concentrated in those industry. Bahrain follows while Qatar has the smallest amounts. Um, so problems associated with uh, this dynamic is one noticeable feature is that the Gulf majority of business elite dominated industries mainly employ migrant workers especially in the construction industry and, and if you know that you know the youth are really uh, not interested in participating in this industry and um i mean it wouldn't even be viable with it when compare when you look at the rates that the migrant workers are being paid it just doesn't make economic sense um uh, and the second industry that i discussed that's uh, influenced by them is the real estate industry and in the Gulf, the real estate industry is overbelt to the, stink, to the extent that if expatriates were to leave, prices would pl plummet and a housing crisis would ensue. So that's another issue where there's a, a challenge for the business elites bringing in you know, the youth into the private sector. Um, definitely, they would not want um, expatriates to leave um, uh, or, or you know, not continue working in the private sector. Aside from their economic benefits, there's another indirect economic benefits of the real estate market. Um, and you know, I believe that the real estate and construction allows the elite to continue um, commissioning these big white elephant mega projects that are wasteful, I think, to youth employment. And is it is is an um, opportunity cost for economic development and diversification? Um, instead of investing in R and D to create new products and develop nascent industries, the business elite families have been incentivized as agents of turnkey projects. Namely, you know they they have uh, contracts with big Western companies or other companies worldwide, where they sell their products locally and don't really have the incentive to create their own products or develop in, or invest in R&D. R&D is a whole nother issue. Um, uh, so basically, with looking at uh, the distribution of market uh, uh, capitalization, um, the different levels of business elite dominance in important industries, um, I think that uh, there is a variation in the amount of autonomy that um, the GCC uh, governments really have in implementing reform.
I actually have written other pieces. I have an, a journal article coming out with the new political economy about how the politics on the ground work with this. Um, but I wanted to, in this piece, to to look at the trends of how much business elites have influence in private sectors to kind of get at um, the relationship, uh, the state business relationships between um, the elites and the state. Um, in and the conflicting interests with regards to implementing reform that is important um, for economic diversification. Um, and so in conclusion, a uh, dilemma in the Gulf states is that state survival is linked to the longevity of the economy and youth employment, which deviates really from business elites interests. And this is consequential um, for policymaking approaches um, to the politics of economic reform uh, processes needed to accommodate the large use, youth. And this research draws on a ca comparison between Gulf states with high degrees of business elite influence over the economy and ones with more centralized uh, state-led capitalism to illuminate how these variables affect the viability of achieving economic reforms. Um, and um, I think I will stop there now for the sake of time.